Uh, I want to do some things to help maybe uh, deepen our understanding of Lehi's dream and subsequently Lehi, uh, Nephi's dream. Uh, you'll notice in this case, um, the Lord is a visual uh, teacher. He gives Lehi a vision to see uh, some things to help teach a principle. So in this case, I, I might do the same thing if I were teaching this. I would, uh, maybe if I have youth or young adults or children, I would have them draw. I'm like, we're going to read something. When you see it in the scriptures, draw it on your paper. There's a power in doing that. Maybe if I were doing an adult Sunday school class, I might just show a couple of artist renditions because you have shorter time periods to do this. Uh, well, this will take two weeks in uh, our Come Follow Me curriculum. So let's take a look at a few things here that I think would be helpful. Besides, the visual sometimes adds uh, depth or meaning. Uh, some people aren't visual learners. Maybe they should draw a list. Everything you see, write it down, and then write down what the meaning is. And I would go one step further. Where's the Savior in that meaning? Which we'll talk about here as we go. Go to chapter 8, 1 Nephi chapter 8. Because uh, 1 Nephi chapter 8 covers, well, it's the dream, right? Uh, verse 2, Lehi has the dream, and he calls it a vision. Uh, as you go through the items here, like verse 4, it's a dark and dreary wilderness. That's difficult to draw. So I might not necessarily draw the one, maybe just write that one down or have them draw it. And notice verse 5, there's a man in a white robe who's going to show him throughout this journey. I think there's a power in knowing that sometimes we need a guide to know where we're going in here. And he's there for a long time, verse 8. Okay, verse 9, you have the field. Verse 10, you have the tree and you have the fruit, including what the fruit does for you. A lot of people are like, what's the benefit of the church? What's the goal of the church? What does the Savior do for us? Men are that they might have joy. In this case, the fruit and the tree make us happy. But you'll see a few people who choose to take it and then they turn from that happiness. Do you know someone who's done that? Like they know what's making them happy and they're deliberately doing something that doesn't make them happy. So let's keep going here for a moment. Go down to verse 12. Why does Lehi want his family at the tree? Again, I think it goes back to the happiness thing. I also think this is a sign of conversion. If you're on the covenant path, but haven't partaken of the fruit yet, you're probably more concerned about yourself. But once you've partaken of the fruit, you're like, okay, I want somebody else to have this. And sometimes this is non-members. I've seen non-members be some of our better missionaries because they're like, wow, I'm partaking of this fruit as I'm going on this journey, meeting with the missionaries. I want other people to have it. And that's sometimes we've been on the path for so long or we're maybe sitting at the tree that we're so content, we're not thinking about others. But I, I do think a sign of conversion is you want other people to have this. Go to verse 14. Uh, notice, Sariah, Nephi, and Sam, these are good people. They, they don't know where to go. They're not lost. They just don't know how to get to the tree. I think that we need a guide. Uh, we need to be shown where the fruit is, the tree is. I think there's a lot of people in this category. They know uh, things about the Savior. They know goodness. They want happiness. They just they just need someone to help them show them how to get there. Go down to verse 23. Again, I hope you're, you I go through all of these things, like 19 is the rod of iron and so forth. 20 is a straight and narrow path. But uh, just go to verse 23 for a moment. And, and then I want you to look and see where does the mist of darkness appear in the dream. Where's it at? I, I think it's on the path. I, I think it's everywhere. Just like on a, on a foggy morning, where does the fog go? Well, it might hit and miss different places, but really it, it can go everywhere. I, I think those on the covenant path can get lost in that fog. That's why the rod of iron is so important. If you're holding on to that, you don't get lost. So I think sometimes we think, you know, I'm, I'm going to church. I'm okay. But if you're literally not holding on to that rod of iron, then we, we get lost. Go to verse 25. Why did some people 
get lost or walk away from the tree. I mean, if you're having happiness, partaking of the fruit, why would you ever leave it? Look at verse 25. They took their eye off the tree. Now the question is, what is the tree? What is the fruit? Well, it's the Savior. Once we take our eyes off the Savior and he is no longer our focus, we're going to have thoughts about other things. Um, let's do a couple more things that might help with this. Verse 27, who is in the great and spacious building? The answer is anybody can be there. It's not a respecter of persons. You can be young, you can be old, you can be rich, you can be poor, you can be male, you can be female. Basically, pride can is the universal sin, quoting Ezra Taft Benson, meaning anybody, everybody, can be in that great and spacious building if they if they choose to be there. Obviously, we don't want to. And the question is, is what's going on in that great and spacious building? Here's the answer. Nothing. Because where are they all at? The second you get in that building, where do you go? You go to the balcony. You go to the windows. You look outside. Nobody's having fun inside. That's Pride isn't a great time in yourself. All pride is, is looking outward at others and pointing and mocking and making fun of. The great and spacious building is not a great time. It's just trying to knock other people down. Go to verse 28. Again, why do these people leave the tree? Well, the answer is really in verse 33 and 34. Why did Lehi and Nephi not leave the tree. I, I Here's a powerful teaching moment. How can somebody not fall away into a personal apostasy? The answer is in 33 and 34. The very end of verse 33. We, this is Lehi's family, heeded them not. In other words, Verse 34, there are the words of my, these are the words of my father, for as many as heeded them, in other words, you started to pay attention to the great and spacious building, fall away. Again, I, I know many people who are struggling with their testimony, and I think that's a real struggle, and it's a real battle. But you get a hold of anti-Mormon literature, uh, you get a hold of people who are in the great and spacious building mocking you for being a member of this church trying to destroy your faith. If you start listening to them, that's when you fall away. So here is my my counsel, my love. I, I would bring this up in any class, primary, Sunday school, uh, any adult classes. If you start listening to the naysayers, that's when you start looking away from the tree. Don't focus on what people say about Joseph Smith 200 years ago. That's being spread around with false half-truths and misinterpretation and historical distortions. Focus on the tree. Read the Book of Mormon. Focus on Jesus Christ. Focus on your covenants. You won't fall away. It's when you start reading and looking at all that other stuff that's out there that uh, will start to pose doubt and so forth. Let's go to... Let's go to verse 38. Just the very last verse here for a moment. Uh, when should a parent stop preaching to their kids? I'm saying this because maybe you have had a thought, well, I don't want to preach to my kids. It'll just push them away. Well, I think Lehi gives a, an answer here. Uh, verse 38, after he had preached unto them and prophesied to them, the very end of verse 38, he did cease speaking unto them. I think there's a point where you have, as a parent, have a responsibility to preach to your kids, to teach your kids. You make sure they understand those prophecies. And then when they're adults, at some point, you stop preaching. You still love them. And when you get something new that needs to be preached, I mean, if you have a vision, I mean, 
Lehi is preaching to his kids here. Laman and Lemuel are not young people. So he's preaching until the message has been said, and then you stop. I, I thought that was at least helpful for me. Go to chapter 11 then. Why does Nephi get to see this same vision and adds a lot of details that we don't get from Le excuse me, Nephi's account of what Lehi saw? Lehi may have seen more things, but Nephi really wanted to know. And I think in verse 1, where it says, I had desired to know the things, and I believed my father. I think you have to believe and you have to have a desire. And then the vision comes. And then he has that beautiful dream. Now, I want you to go to verse 21 and 22. You know what the dream is, right? He sees the nativity. And then the question is, is what does the nativity have to do with the tree? I mean, they even asked Nephi, do you understand it? And he's like, oh, I don't understand all of this. But finally... Nephi gets to make the connection. Again, notice he has a tour guide helping him through the dream. Somebody's there to walk him through this. But 23 to 2, Nephi finally gets it. He goes, I understand the nativity. I answered saying, yea, it is the love of God. Well, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Make the connection. Everything about the nativity is the dream. Now, again, teachers I, I, and parents, I would make sure you understand that everything you draw on this is either uh, Jesus Christ or it's the opposite, the enemies of Christ that are trying to take away from Christ. So take a look at all of the, of the items here. Verse 25, the rod of iron. This is chapter 11 again, verse 25. What's the rod of iron? Well, it's the word of God. Well, Jesus is the Word. He called himself the Word. It's First John chapter 1. So what's the Word of God? It's Christ. The living water. Well, what's the living water? It's Jesus Christ. He calls himself the living water. And then he says, notice, the living water or to the tree of water, a tree of life, which waters are the tree, the water, uh, the tree of life. It's the love of God. Again, Jesus Christ is the tree. He's the tree. He's the path. He's called himself the path. I am the way. So Jesus Christ, the path. He's the rod of iron. He's the pure water, the living water, not the fountain of filthy water. But he's also the fruit. Again, the fruit of Jesus Christ is his atonement. The gift that he gives us that brings more joy because of what the atonement does for us. So make sure your students understand that this dream is a dream about Christ. And if you have drawn all these beautiful objects in this dream, or you have made a list, you have made a drawing or a list about the Savior and the things that try to get him away, uh, people away from the Savior. Let's go down to verse 20. No, let's go to 34. Uh, verse 34. I, I probably would make sure you mention 32 and 33 um, because it's about Christ, right? His life, his birth, his life, his death, and so forth. Verse 34. Now we're going to see what takes place after. Uh, what is going to happen? We have this beautiful plan of salvation, the covenant path. Are we on the covenant path? Are we progressing towards the tree? Are we partaking of the tree? And once we're there, do we focus on the tree rather than look at those around us? So now we're going to see people are going to oppose everything that has to do with that joy, happiness, that tree and that path. Verse 34, I, after he was slain, I saw the multitudes of the earth. So we're talking all the people of the earth. What do they do? They're gathering to fight. Notice, it specifically says against the apostles. Now, you could go back and take this first century and say this is fighting against the original 12 apostles. Why? It's because they carry the message of Jesus Christ. But I think that goes today too. 
you will have the world fight against the apostles of Jesus Christ. You will have them fight against those who have priesthood, authority, and keys. Why? Because everything they do, everything they do, is to lead people to Christ. Get them on and stay on that covenant path and make people happy. And the adversary wants to do the opposite. Now, if you go to the very end of verse 35, even the house of Israel is going to gather to fight against the 12 apostles. You will see members of this church fight adamantly. Again, social media, newspaper reporting, uh, uh, the press loves a story of conspiracy. So when they can find uh, members of the church who will attack the church, they love that. They get a lot of press. So uh, even at the end of verse 36, thus shall be the nation, the destruction of all nations. What will be the destruction of all nations? Kindreds, tongues, and people, what will destroy the, the, the world? That shall fight against the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So let's conclude with this. You draw the tree. You draw the path. You draw this great dream. And then you put yourself on. Where on that covenant path are you? If you're in the middle of the midst of darkness, how do you be saved? It's easy. Hold on to the rod. What's the rod? It's Christ. It's the word of God. Study your scriptures. If you're partaking of the fruit, if you've been to the temple, you're. what do you do? Focus on the Savior. Because if you don't, Nephi and Lehi make it very clear. I mean, Laman and Lemuel were children of a prophet. But they would not focus on Jesus Christ. They listened to the world, to the naysayers, to the anti. Anyone who will attack a prophet and apostle. Uh, whether there's a policy that you don't like or a doctrine that you struggle with or some historical context that's really difficult to understand. And I get it. They're there. The answer is clear. Just open up the Book of Mormon. Read that great text. Study the life of Jesus Christ. Draw closer to him. And you won't be swept away by the flood. You won't be... Uh, slip down to the gulf. You'll stay on higher ground where the Savior Jesus Christ is. I testify that is true. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.